Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are watching our podcast. This is episode seven, I believe. Uh, sounds about right, yeah. Sounds about right, yeah. No. We, we've already lost track. <laughs> well, it seems like we do this all the time, but it's actually, we're just sitting down having fun. Yeah. So, but anyway, for those of you listening in and watching, this is our train talk from Milepost 141. This is our Soundtrack Soundbites podcast. And every two weeks or so, I think we're posting yeah, these. That's what we decided on. Um, a new look into some of our topics of things that we've been working on, models, projects, yeah. and uh, maybe some little tips and hints mm-hmm. and things like that that maybe we haven't done a uh, full YouTube video on, or maybe this is where yeah. we invite you to tell us what kind of topics would you like us to talk about. Yeah. Do bear in mind, though, these are pre-recorded, so it may be a little bit till we get to your topic. So. Well, details. <laughs> <laughs> we do pre-record them, and that way we can make sure that uh, we have them ready to go. Because, of course, I travel a lot for shows and other yeah, stuff. You're going to be doing that a lot next month, aren't you? I'll be doing that a lot in the month of September, so it'll be yeah. very difficult to try to stay. So we're, we're recording this towards the end of August. Right. So... But anyway, so where, where are you going in September anyway? So in September, I've got the Narrow Gauge Convention. Okay. That's going to be dis, or, uh, September 11th through the 14th in gotcha. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm actually really looking forward to it. They changed up the schedule quite a bit this year. So where they normally have the schedule is 8 a.m. to noon, and then from noon to 6, you get to run around, mm-hmm. see all the layouts, and do the tours, and shop and eat and do all that stuff and then it would be open from 6 to 9 30 or 10 depending on where it's been yeah over in years past so this year where it's it's got a different schedule every day and thursday is the only day that holds that schedule so uh, wednesday when it opens instead of the there's never a morning session on wednesday but we're doing a uh six to or i'm sorry that's two to six i believe is the vendor hall open on wednesday mm-hmm. which means we're done at six so i can have time to go get a meal and then go back to the room and sleep and yeah that that'll instead be nice. of because i tend to be up late anyway so the sooner i can try to go to bed yeah but then uh thursday is the 8 a.m to noon and then 6 to 9 30 uh sessions and then friday is i believe i saw one to seven okay so that'll be interesting and then saturday's morning till one um, 8 a.m. to 1 so that's kind of cool so it gives us some time to go out and get around but um, the one thing I loved about that that session though is that you had that six hours to go see the layouts and I really enjoyed that because you get to see some really fantastic layouts yeah I remember um, you showed me a few photos of last year's yeah when you came back from last year's one so I was getting I was looking forward to getting back out to I know I think the McKeesport uh, train club that I visited last year Mm -hmm. I think they're going to be open on the tour Um, the West Pennsylvania modelers I'm not sure if they're on it or not yet I haven't looked um, at all of them but I'm looking forward to seeing some of that and then of course seeing some of you guys Uh, so by the time you see this I may have already been there and back but we'll see all right after that I come back on the fly back on Saturday night and then the following weekend, we'll be at the Colorado RPM, and that's the Colorado mm-hmm. Model Railroad Museum is hosting yeah. our own RPM. And I say ours because Soundtracks is a major sponsor of that event. Yeah. And um, obviously, it's Colorado. We're co- we're based in Durango, in you know Colorado. Well, I'll use a so. fra- I'll use a phrase from an American uh, from an American Airlines uh, mm-hmm. uh, company, sure. an American airline company. And they used to, when we lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, they would always say, we're best here, and we're the best here. Okay. And I like that. We're based in Colorado, and we're the best in Colorado. There you go. Take that for what it means. <laughs> but we manufacture all our stuff here, so yeah. it only made sense that we really support the Colorado RPM. So that's taking place on um, the Saturday. What is the Saturday? The 21st, I believe it is. I'm drawing. I don't have it in front of me. Hold on. I can look at my phone really quickly and it'll tell me <laughs> since I have it out here to show off my models um, 
let me see here really quickly. The 21st is the Saturday, so I was right. Um, so the 21st will be the uh, uh, Colorado RPM, and you can okay. sign up at corpm dot org or you can come in at the door we'll have people being able to take at the door so if you're seeing this before then be sure to come out and see us and uh show your support for the colorado model railroad museum yes um because a lot of this is also going to help benefit them as well yeah. so uh looking forward to that so then after that i'm going on a personal vacation oh i'm going to get out for uh, about a week and a half yes i'm going to go play with the house of the mouse <laughs> out in florida I see, I see. My wife is a huge Disney fan, and so we're going to uh, go spend a week down there in Florida and visit and bounce around and do all the cool stuff down there. So Okay. It's not just for kids. It's a really <laughs> cool place to go. But we're going primarily for her. Um, and then after that, I'll come back and go to the uh, Missouri Pacific Historical Society meet. Yeah, uh, you tell me about that. It's co Hosted with the Durang or the uh, the Durang the <laughs> Denver and Rio Grande modelers uh, historical meet, um, and so it's a joint convention. So I'm doing a clinic there, talking about operations okay. and you know running your trains more prototypically, especially using our product. Yeah, which is part of why I have what I have here in front of me. Okay, um, this was part of. Um, Part of my getting ready for the clinic, which I got to start writing here very soon. So if you're seeing this before October, I will have written it by then. So, but first, let's start off with what you modeled. Nothing. You haven't done anything. Nope. Fat no. lot, lot of zip. Yeah. Well, I do know. I will give you a little bit of credit. You were moving and having yeah. to. You know, you were homeless there for a week. You know, and and somebody who wonderfully took care of you for a week Thank and you, George. let you stay at the house for a week while you <laughs> got settled in your new place. Um, that's what we do. We take care yeah. of our friends and okay. family here. So so what I did is I knew that you had nothing. So that's why I brought two models. Oh, since okay. you had something to show okay. off, but I'll do it for you. <laughs> I, I should have something by next week. Don't you all worry. So anyway... But what I did was I put together, now these are some Rapido F40 PHs, and to be fair, I've already had them mm -hmm. uh, together in a while. What I did this past week is I upgraded them to Blue Nami, and what I'm doing is uh, one of the things the Rio Grande had on their railroad was they always had to have a Grand Loco on the point. Okay. So if you ever watch the Amtrak trains running through on the Durango, I mean, on the there I go trying to say it again. <laughs> the Durango and Silverton. No, the Denver and Rio Grande Western. I'm going to have to kid fix that before the convention. Yeah. But anyway, well, whenever nobody they... told me Amtrak ran it on three foot gauge. No. <laughs> Little known borrowed those Central America units. But anyway, when they would run on the Denver and Rio Grande Western, the Grand had to put a pilot locomotive yeah. on front. And so basically, every time you look at old videos, of the uh, California Zephyr mm -hmm. and stuff running through on the Moffat line, you always saw a grand, usually a Jeep 40 on the point. And I always wondered, why do they need that extra power? Those two F40s are more than enough to handle the 12 or 13 cars that they carried. Yeah. But it was a Rio Grande thing that they had to have it on the point. So okay. uh, I decided to go ahead and upgrade these to Blue Nami. But then I'm also going to uh, upgrade a Jeep 40 from the, the Tsunami 2 to... to uh, uh, oh, to pair with it? To pair with it and kind of show how oh, you're going to do that. Oh, we know what you're bringing in next week, then. <laughs> well, I haven't finished it yet. I don't know. We'll have to see. But, chop, chop. <laughs> but anyway, so that's why I upgraded these. But I also put in, um, I had two of our cube speakers. I replaced one of our cube speakers with the uh, scale sound system speakers. Mm. So I've got one of ours and one of their, one of his speakers in there. Yeah. And they sound great. Um, right. I will tell you the volume's down low. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute um, the locomotives here. Now, on these uh, locomotives, you have the headlight. Now, I've already got them consisted. Now, as you can see here in the screen, I've got them consisted under consist A. And I figured A made sense for Amtrak. <laughs> but anyway, so consist A. Get and the stage. <laughs> no. So anyway, so I've got these locomotives. And I, and I do my own personal remapping. So as you can see here on the screen, these aren't the factory default function mapping um, but what I have over here is you can see I've got my strobe lights so when I turn the strobe lights on I've actually got my strobes on here and it was interesting I was what I had them wired to two separate function outputs mm -hmm. 
and I would have them turn on and off separately. But I was watching some videos getting prepped for this installation, and every one of those F40PHs in that era flashed together, okay. which was amazing to me, because I always thought they flashed separately, but then I was 12, 13, 10, 12, 13, you know, your age at that time. <laughs> so anyway, my point being was I didn't remember them doing it, but I know how a strobe light works. Yeah. So I just assumed they flashed, but I was watching a bunch of videos and every one of them flashed simultaneously. So I rewired them. Okay. And wired them together and put them in. So when I put that in there. Also freed up a, uh, freed you up to add even more lights. I did. <laughs> But and then I have my front number boards on okay. and when the front number boards turn on I guess I should move this other camera over here that apparently fell asleep on me Because oh. I wasn't actually recording on it. So I probably should show this on the second angle here So we'll put this over here recording? Uh, Now it is <laughs> now we're recording so there I got my go. strobe lights on here So I don't it's gonna be hard to see it because they're not very bright the LED actually sits below them. So I'm gonna to try to do something to frost the outside lens so that it diffuses yeah. the light a little yeah, better. I, can, I just saw it there. You can see it, but it's not very it's bright. Dim. So Yeah, you can barely see it. But what I did was I turned, I took the uh, number boards and wired them together with the truck lights. Okay. So my truck lights are on and the number boards are on together. So I'm using the same function. Um, so of course, now, the differences between the units, I actually was kind of cool. I didn't know this until I started working on these things a little bit more. Um, but later versions of the F40PH were delivered with a K5 LA. Okay. The early versions were a P5. So when we look at Locomotive 200, which was obviously the first in the, in the uh, uh, series, yeah. that's got a P5 uh, air horn on it, which was a little bit different. Yeah. So they sound different, which is cool. So now when I run them in either direction. You get different horns. I can get different horns. But what's really cool about this, and, and this is one of the benefits of consisting here with the Blue Nami, is that um, when you talk about head-end power, yeah, this is something that seems like a lot of people either forget about, don't know about, or just flat out ignore. Mm -hmm. Because again, when it comes to your DCC systems, how do you access function 16? It's not always intuitive. Um, but here, when I go over here to my function list, you can see right there on the screen, it says HEP mode. Yeah. So when I did my consisting, now I did a longer video on this and you can see that on our YouTube channel, but passenger operations are actually pretty fascinating. Yeah. There's a lot of really cool things that you can do and this is just one of them is head-end power with these F40 pHs. And so when I look at these two locomotives, if I was running head-end power, now head-end power, for those of you guys who don't know, is when they would run the diesel engine up to notch eight and the reason for it was because on the main generator, instead of just using the power for attractive effort, they actually would route some of that power to the cars running in the train yeah. behind them for passenger service. So lights, air conditioning units, um, stoves, cooking, yeah. all, all the facilities were run by electric power off of the locomotive, hence head-end power. Yeah. Now, when it was typically one locomotive running on your train, of course, it would be that locomotive. But when you have two, they would actually turn on head-end power on the trailing unit. Mm -hmm. And the reason was, was because head-end power, when that diesel engine is notched up all the way, it's loud, yeah. it's uncomfortable, and that locomotive is shaking. So the crew would actually put it in the second unit so, so that- they didn't have to deal with that for the entire journey. Correct, okay. they have a more comfortable ride. Yeah. So if you look here, uh, when I go into my consist settings, on my screen, um, when I go into my consist functions, when I go open up my lead locomotive, I'll scroll and you can see that I have head end power disabled. Mm -hmm. But when I go to my rear locomotive, which is, is in this case, I scroll to my head end power and you'll see that it's checked. Okay. So that way, when I come back in here and I turn on head end power, it actually turns on this only unit. Only on the rear unit. Only on the rear unit. And so this unit is the one that's getting the RPMs. So these little these locomotives were nicknamed little screamers because they would sit at the depot with running at notch eight all the time because they were generating power for the yeah. train. So people called them, oh, that's those screamers again. And so that was what was really neat. So we can more accurately model that now 
with our Tsunami 2 and, of course, Blue Nami, yeah. which is what I'm showing off here. Now, because we're competing for noise, I'm going to go ahead and mute my locomotives so I can finish talking. But when it comes to passenger operation, there's a lot of cool stuff. Um, like the SDP-40s in the Amtrak era, the mm -hmm. failed units, and maybe even those early E units, um, those were actually uh, steam generators. Right, because they had the, the old steam train line through for the heating. Correct. So the train line would come in off the steam generator. So when they were transitioning from steam to diesel, they didn't immediately change all the power equipment. So those are in there, and then some of the very, very new stuff took that electrical generation off of the main generator. Right, the, the HEP generator. The H and they would have a secondary diesel engine and a secondary HEP. So yeah. you really, if you're not sure about this or you want to learn more about it, be sure to check out our YouTube channel for operations oh, yeah. and passenger service where I've covered each of those scenarios and show you examples of each and how they would be used. So. Go to youtube.com and search Soundtracks Passenger Operations. You'll see several videos we've done uh, on it, including the P-42s, the F-59 PHIs, and, mm. and the uh, um, the F-59 PH. That, yeah, the F-59 PH and the PHIs were different locomotives, even though they had the same prefix. Yeah. They were drastically differently designed locomotives. I had to double check myself because I'm like, wait a minute, what am I forgetting? <laughs> Um, there's a lot of numbers and stuff f f bouncing around this vacuous space up here. We have no doubt of that. <laughs> so, but anyway, there's some really cool stuff when it comes to passenger operations. Um, and of course I gave this my normal treatment. It's got some basic weathering. And then of course I had to do my, uh, magna lock, brake lock, brake lines and the, uh, air hoses, um, in the MU I also cable noticed an, a new cable there. Is that that you said? That's the MU cable. Yeah, the orange one is the MU cable, or the okay. red one is the MU cable, and the other the Magnalock brake lines. And yeah, if you're just I, I've noted, seen the the brake lines before. You've I've, seen the others too. Because all, all the ones I've upgraded to Blue Army mm -hmm. have that as well. Got all right. You get those from Pacific Western Rail Services up in uh, Canada. He's got them. You can buy them as a kit where you can get the Magnalock brake lines. And you just glue the brake lines to your uh, brake casting, the brake pipe mm -hmm. casting, cut the arrows off and glue it in. And then this, you just drill a small hole where your MU hose is, where okay. your MU connector is, just paint over it and you'll never see it. And it's magnetic because it's mm -hmm. magnetic through the paint. So if it's not on there, then it's connected. All right. So, but it's really cool. It's a really neat and one of those under looked at uh, uh, features built into the locomotives when you're running. So. That's one of my favorite things to add. And it really adds that extra element. And eventually I'm getting to the point where I'll run it through everything. And then now that I'm starting to upgrade my Amtrak fleet, I'm actually gonna add some more cables. So, Cause he makes them in red, blue, and yellow. So I was figuring I'll get them in a couple of different colors and make the MU uh, for the head, for, for passenger operations between the Superliner cars. Mm. That'd be fun. That'd be a really neat uh, yeah. feature. So just haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> but anyway, be sure to check that out if you want to learn a lot more about passenger operations, how you can get the most out of it. I'll give you a trivia question, and you may have already heard it, but if I put a third unit here, where is the HEP going to go? Mid-unit. Mid-unit. Why is that? Because they don't want to walk that far. Yep. <laughs> this came to us from an Amtrak engineer, so I will use his phrase, railroaders are lazy. <laughs> and so if there was an issue developed with the head-end power, they didn't want to have to walk all the way to the third unit to fix and address it. So it was always in the second unit behind theirs, yeah. uh, unless there was just one unit by itself. So there's your little fun fact for the day. So be sure to check out those videos. Well, that's everything I've got for now. Let's go ahead and go to our special guest. So we got our special guest. We got Mike from Doc's Caboose. Now, Mike is part of Red's Train Repair. Yeah. And he used to be based out of California, but then he came to the Kansas City area and got affiliated with Doc's Caboose, which I'm really excited about. Yeah. Doc's, Doc's got a prime location, so we're gonna learn all about that here. So let's welcome in uh, Mike from Doc's Caboose. So hopefully we'll be able to get him zoomed in. And uh, Mike, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you guys. All right, so welcome to the podcast. We're glad yeah, to welcome. have you here. And uh, so tell me a little bit about what you guys are seeing out there at Doc's Caboose. I've, I know I've been to the store a couple of times over the years. Um, you got a great train watching location. Yeah, we, uh, Doc has, uh, Doc, the owner of the store, unfortunately couldn't be with us today, he's under the weather, but Doc uh, has two cameras uh, up on the top of his building, 
he owns the building here and he has one face in one direction and another camera face in the other part of that whole virtual rail fan uh, world. Mm, okay. Okay. So yeah, we are literally a, a stone's throw away from the Union Pacific main line. And it was actually the original Missouri Pacific main line. Even better. I, kn I knew, I heard you. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, that's what you would go. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we, uh, we've recently got big, uh, back and, uh, going with your guys' product again. And the biggest seller for the most part has been the, uh, the Tsunami 2 uh, EMD. The EMD has been the fan favorite over here at our store. Um, I, I would do, uh, you know, an occasional Steam, uh, an occasional uh, GE product. Uh, but then I would have to say the second favorite here, uh, which I've been actually pushing a lot here lately, has been your mobile decoders. Ju just your regular function decoders okay. outside of the, outside of the uh, Tsunami 2. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of people have been coming in wanting to just get started into the DCC world, mm -hmm. and I've uh, showed them that uh, your guys' products, you guys, you guys have non-sound decoders just like everyone else out here in the world. Mm -hmm. But I've been, but I have proved to them that your motor control on those has been second to none, really. I, wow. I found that your motor control has been amazing on your uh, just your non-sound uh, decoders. But um, here lately, I've actually been getting a big push finally on uh, some of the Blue Nami items. Okay. But but yeah, for the most part, it's been uh, the regular mobile decoders and been the uh, EMD Tsunami 2s. Gotcha. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that. The mobile yeah. decoders seem to be one of the how shall I say it? It's, hidden it's gems. Hidden gem, forgotten. Yeah. It's kind of false second because sound is in our name, of course. Yeah. Right. And so it, it tends to be forgotten or overlooked or, as, you know, or assumed, oh, well, these are an also product just to have them out there. But they're actually really cool. And I don't know if you know this, um, but it actually has functioning braking built into yeah. the decoder. I've noticed that on a couple of the more I've, uh, gone in and adjusted settings for some mm -hmm. of my some of my customers I've done for my personal customers and customers for the store. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that, you know, it's had, you know, functional braking on that. Yeah, it's, it's built in there so that that way it's compatible to run with any of our sound decoders so that you don't have yeah. to sacrifice the ability to use the, uh, the, the braking, the braking function. on the, like the Tsunami 2 and the Econami. Correct. You can still use them with the mobile decoders. Mm -hmm. So it makes it much more useful for something like a B unit. Mm -hmm. Although my, my personal preference with those is Eco Nami. So yeah, Blue Nami at all? <laughs> because when you get Blue Nami, and then this is why I really push it, is because you get the benefit of all the above. So yeah. you get a DCC decoder. So if you still want to use your DCC system, great. If you mm -hmm. want to use the Blue Nami app, great. If you want to pair it with a mobile decoder, those don't have the Bluetooth connection. So then you just use your DCC yep. system and therefore you don't lose anything, but you have that freedom. But I like putting Blue Nami in everything because every locomotive will then have its own voice. But then also I can take advantage of all the braking. So we have not just the um, independent braking, which is the brake squeal, yep. but we also have the functioning automatic. And then with the Tsunami 2 family, which dynamics the Blue Nami well. is part of. The, it has dynamic braking as well. So, but the good news is, is that if you are using a mobile decoder with that, you can set the braking rates to match the same. And then you do have to enable it in the motor decoders. Yeah. It comes disabled by the factory. Well, it's the same as in Tsunami too. It's just set to zero. It's already function mapped. Oh, is it function yeah. mapped? I haven't used it. It's on that okay. Well, I don't use the mobile decoders as much. So. <laughs> It, it, it is a nice option I do give to uh, customers out there who, A, want to get st first started into DCC, mm -hmm. but also, you know, give them an opportunity to, to try out some of your uh, products at more of a entry-level cost. Sure. And uh, here, here a couple weeks ago, we did a couple train shows, one on Saturday, which was the Turkey Creek NMRA show mm -hmm. over in Mission, Kansas, and then we did... Uh, did more of a swap and shop type show over at the uh, expo center there at the uh, Kansas city international airport. And uh, I put together a, a demo unit 
for a uh, customer, for people coming to check our table out for, for the store and for my repair. Mm-hmm. Uh, it gave them an opportunity to uh, try out your uh, Blue Nami. And, you know, you were making some comments about uh, people enjoying the, uh, the ease of uh, settings, you know, changing settings and whatnot. That was actually the big selling point. I sold, I think, a total of eight Blue Nami decoders. Oh, wow. Over the- yeah. Yes, I, I sold. That was the big seller for the weekend. And whenever I actually handed people my phone, I had the demo set up on my cell phone. Mm-hmm. Um, when I handed them my phone, I said, play with it. Take it for, for take it for a test drive on the test track. You want to change the headlight setting? Change it to a Mars light. You know, play with it. Get a feel for it. Mm-hmm. And whenever they did that, they realized that, you know, you guys have preached and talked about it. It takes the guesswork out of everything. It does. It really does. It simplifies and brings... People who aren't computer savvy, who aren't savvy with JMRI, aren't good with going into their NCE or Digitrax or ESU DCC systems, it gives them ease an ease, ease of mind type thing to be able to go in and change settings to where they can make it run like the big time installers, the uh, the big time runners. You know, it allows a new world for people, and that was the big seller. And has finally opened up our customers' eyes here at the store uh, for Doc's Caboose. It really yeah. has changed uh, changed things for a lot of people. Well, that's awesome. And, yeah. and I mean, you guys have got a great area out there. Um, I was actually out there in February in Kansas City doing an op session. <laughs> and um, it was really fun. I got to go to one layout and my uh, brain is going blank as far as... Oh, you're uh, talking about Prairie Rail. Prairie Rails, correct. Right. Um, I was out there operating and there was one of the layouts. It was the, I, I, unfortunately, I think it's going to be last year. It was on this layout. He was still using Dynatrol, but I was so happy oh, wow. that he had a blue Nami and he said, I would be honored if you would run it. And I said, I would be honored to run it because I don't want to go back to Dynatrol. Yeah. I remember you mentioning that when you, yeah. you know, left the office and left me alone to handle all the calls and all the emails for several days. Well, you can look at it this way. <laughs> I feel confident enough in your abilities to leave you behind to handle the calls. You can look at it that way. So that should be a compliment to you. I know. I'm just giving you a hard time. Well, that's a good thing. So Prairie Rails is one of the fun. But like I said, I got to run Blue Nami on this Dynatrol layout, which was fantastic because now I didn't have to deal with that archaic stuff and having to make sounds in my own noises and stuff when I'm running trains. But... Um, he was having a lot of issues, so it, it'll be the probably. I would say I understood it was going to be the probably the last time it was on Prairie Rails. Um, and I'm draw, like I said, I'm drawing a blank on the name. It was um, a horse. It was the Pennsylvania Horseshoe Curve. I keep wanting to say Doug. Oh, I remember seeing. I know which one you're talking. Yeah, about. you know what I'm talking about. I, but, remember, I, I remember seeing the list of who was uh, having off sessions. Yep. Yeah. So, but that's one of my favorite events. It's one of the few that I actually go out and do. Um, but you guys have got a great uh, model railroading community out there. You've got some great stores in the area, including Doc's Caboose. And uh, so, um, and as, I, as you said, you're, you're seeing an uptick in Blue Nami. And I know we're seeing it for sure in our, our side as well. So it's fantastic that you guys have that demo to get it in customers' hands. Because that's one of the things. Guys, if you haven't tried it out, really take an effort. Go try it out. Go look at it. Um, contact your local store or try one out. Um, I've yet to have anybody tell me they felt like they wasted their money on it. And I've certainly had a lot of people saying, oh my God, this is the best thing to happen to DCC yeah. or to model train yeah. since DCC. Best things since sliced bread. I've heard a couple times. Yeah. So. <laughs> even, even for myself, uh, after building that the demo for the store here, mm-hmm. um, I, I've even gone out for one of my uh, Frisco, one of my favorite Frisco units. Um, I've even uh, just purchased my first Blue Nami. Okay. I'm, I'm super stoked to get that installed into my personal unit. So, uh, yeah. Again, yeah, like you guys said, get it in your hands and it will be a complete game changer for you. Awesome. Well, we appreciate the business, obviously. And, and I'll say you've made a huge difference out there at Doc's Caboose. Um, like I said, I've been out there a couple of years in the past. I also know for you Mopac guys, that's the home of the Missouri Pacific uh, Historical Society store. 
So if you need any hats, shirts, whatever, you can get them at Doc's Caboose as well. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the store in general. And then, um, you know, you guys do offer installation services, I assume, now that you're there and so forth. And then, uh, yeah, what are, you, what are you guys out there? So uh, Doc has had the store here. I had to fall back to my notes. I couldn't remember exactly what year it was. But uh, Doc started the store here in uh, back in March of 2002. Okay. Um, as, as I said, uh, the store, the building itself, uh, Doc owns. Doc owns the whole building. Um, it was a uh, back original from the 18, if I remember correctly, he said the late 1800s. So it's actually part of the old historic West Bottoms down here in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, part of the, you know, off of the uh, Union Pacific Main Line, part, you know, the original Missouri Pacific. Um, so yeah, Doc's, uh, Doc's going on his 23rd year here. My wife and I, my wife, Felicia Schmidt, uh, both of us came on board, uh, last summer. She specializes in detailing. I do the, do the repair, you know, and Red's train repair. Yeah. And I'm sure nobody can figure out the nickname, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, we, we offer everything here at the store. The store is really geared towards the modeler's hardware store uh doc we really pride ourselves on that and then with uh, my wife and i coming in uh i've been able to bring a new uh, avenue to the store you know offering repair services i offer the repair services all over kansas city as well um we just happen you know with us you know being part of doc's caboose this is one of my main pickup and drop off locations and uh, it it brings all kinds of people in but but yeah, we've been here. We're working. My wife and I are working our tails off to help bring, uh, Doc bring the store back to uh, its old former glory. And yeah, we're just we're just glad to be a part of the uh, model railroading community here in Kansas City. Yeah, that's awesome. So where can we find uh, Doc's Caboose at? It's uh, doc, docscaboose.biz. If you are not uh, familiar with where the store is located, uh, again, the area is what they call the Old West Bottoms. Mm -hmm. We're at 1400 Union Avenue here in Kansas City, Missouri. 64101 is our uh, is our zip code. And uh, our phone number here is 816-471-7114. And uh, you can call down here. We're open uh, Thursday through Sunday, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And on any of those four days, uh, you'll be able to reach myself, Doc, or my wife, Felicia, um we'll be glad to help you guys out uh, and be help you know glad to help you guys get into any uh soundtracks items and if we can't figure out the answer um george will tell you i talk to him at the very least you know about on average three times a month you know question yeah. orders whatever the case may be yeah i was gonna say it was about a once a week it seems like but yeah, there, there for a while it was definitely yeah. once a week yeah so I think that's awesome. And that shows the great partnership we have too, because we're here to help support you guys mm -hmm. with your hobby. Um, if you have any questions, things like that, and also help support the stores because we want to support the local businesses because the stores have a big challenge that we, you know, we want to make sure that they overcome. So guys try to support your local stores as much as you can. And when you've got a great store like Doc's Caboose out oh, there yeah. that offer the makes service. It much, makes it much better. Makes it much easier to go yeah. support them. Yeah. <laughs> So, Mike, thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll look forward to talking again here in the near future. All right. You guys have a good one. Thanks for having us. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Bye. So, Mike, that was great to have you in and join. We appreciate you yeah. taking the time to come join us on the uh, podcast. That was interesting. Yeah. I'll have to check out that place next time I'm in the area. Yeah, it's a great it's a great store. And I tell you what, with Mike being over there, I guarantee you they're going to turn it around um, and start getting that store because um, they've been kind of around as the middle of the road place for a while, but I'm, I'm excited with what Mike's going to do over there. Yeah. And seeing Doc back in the fold, that's great. Yeah. So, Excellent. well, guys, that's everything we've got wrapped up for this particular session of uh, Train Talk from Milepost 141. This is our Soundtrack Sound Bites podcast, episode number seven, lucky number seven, or is we it? We think. We think. <laughs> So we'll go, we'll go with that. All right. Well, guys, thanks for tuning in. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, um, everything you need to do. If you have any topics or thoughts you want to uh, talk about, give us a call. 
uh, give us an email, support at soundtracks.com. Yeah. Call us up and we'll talk about it and uh, we'll see what we can do about covering new topics here on the podcast. All righty. But this is just and, an afternoon of fun. Yeah. And we do read your comments on YouTube. Um, who knows? We may even start responding to some of them on the show. Maybe. Yeah, we're going to talk about doing that. So yeah. we're, we're like he mentioned earlier on, we do pre-record this. So um, we don't necessarily have last podcast episode yep. stuff to do. We're a few uh, ahead of time. I think this puts us three or four ahead of the Something going like public. Yeah. Um, so we'll we'll look and see where we're at, and uh, we'll get some questions answered here online. So. Be sure to be sure to like though. And make sure you subscribe because that really helps us out. Lets us know that this is interesting for you guys. Yeah. We're trying to do our best to make it interesting and fun, and it's a little uh, glimpse into behind the scenes what we talk about, the stuff that we don't always get to show off oh, uh, yeah. when we're doing our regular YouTube uh, feature videos, talking yeah. about specific parts of. I mean that that we when we're doing those, we do try and uh, sort of guide you through how our thought process and how we selected these values. And one of the things we do is we don't get, uh, say what we personally use, what we've personally decided. Here we can do that. Yep. That's true. So anyway, we've tried to sign this off three times now. <laughs> so. lucky, lucky third time's a charm. There you Let's go. Let's go with that. All right, guys. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next episode. Because if we keep talking, we're never going to have anything to talk about on the next one. True. All right. Bye. <laughs> see you guys. Thanks.